All right. So we're uh, still talking about irreversible additions to carbonyl compounds. And uh, so we just started last time talking about organometallic reagents where we, um, we have carbon alkyl groups bonded to metals. And because we bond the alkyl groups to metals, we change the polarity of the bond. So this is what we're used to, seeing groups like this where carbon's bonded to a group that's um, more electronegative, so electrons flow this direction, which means carbon's partial positive. But if we change that to a metal, um, and the metals from the left-hand side of the periodic table are going to have electronegativities lower than, lower than this. And so the, the electrons now flow the other direction, making us have um, electron-rich carbon. And so there's a bunch of these um, compounds. We're only going to talk about three. So we're going to talk about um, compounds that have a carbon-lithium bond. We're going to have a... a we talk about compounds that have a carbon-magnesium bond and, car and compounds that have a carbon-carper um, bond. So these are the only three that we're going to talk about. So if, let's, let's, let's check out um, electronegativities here and see if we can figure out um, which of these reagents is going to be more, which of these bonds is going to be most polarized and which one's going to be the most reactive. So carbon's going to be 2.5 all the way across for electronegativity. Lithium is 1.0, magnesium 1.2, and copper 1.8. So if we, if we look at the electronegativity difference, we can see which of these bonds is the most polarized. So uh, let's, let's do electronegativity difference here on the left-hand side. And difference. Here it's 1.5, here it is 1.3, and here it is 0 0.7. So you can see that definitely um, the most polar bond is going to be the carbon-lithium bond. Most polar because electronegativity difference is the largest. And so um, that, that, all, what that, all, that also means that um, this is going to be the most electron-rich carbon. Of, for, of, for comparing all three of these species, most electron-rich carbon. So we have electrons flowing towards carbon here, but we have the most electron density flowing towards the carbon um, when we have a carbon-lithium bond. All right, I want to say a couple things because there's a tendency to think of these bonds as um, ionic bonds or not ionic bonds. If you go back to chapter one, we sort of talked about the fact that once the electronegativity gets greater than about 1.7, 1.8, then electrons are transferred completely and we have an ionic compound. Um, but this is not, this is the, the largest difference we have is 1.5, so that is considered to be a carbon-lithium covalent bond. And so these are, these are actually quite different here. So about, about uh, car covalent carbon metal bonds. Um, the reactivity um, towards electrophile depends on the polarity, so organolithium are going to be the most reactive. Greater than organomagnesium. Greater than organocopper. Now, for the most part, we're going to be using organolithium compounds and organomagnesium compounds interchangeably. But there is one reaction where you need a super great electrophile that will work for organolithium but not work for organomagnesium compounds. And that's, that's coming up. So let's label these certainly. And I want you to know this, that organolithium are the most reactive and organocopper least reactive. All right, so we're going to have three different organometallic reagents. Um, there's organolithium and organomagnesium. Organomagnesium have a special name, and that's Grignard. So they're Grignard reagents. 
And um, this, is how, uh, this is how you make them. We have Rx, I don't know why that's cut off there, it looks like it's a little cut off, um, plus two lithium, and you get RLI plus LIX. So here's an example here. Okay, we are at that with lithium. Now, I'm not going to be worrying about stoichiometry on the exam. You can just write lithium. You don't have to write two lithium. There's your organolithium product. And you can leave out stoichiometry and side products. So I don't care about the stoichiometry and I don't care about the side products. All right, so that's an example of organolithium compound. Um, Grignard reaction has a little bit different structure. So we take Rx plus Mg and we get um, Rmgx. So the, the, the halogen that from the Rx actually becomes part of the compound. So it looks a little bit different here. And, um, and it turns out that you must use an ether, ether solvent for this reaction. Organolithium, don't need to use ether, but you definitely need to for a Grignard. Here's an example right here. Mg ether. And your product is MgBr, and this is a Grignard. Grignard reagent. You could also call it organomagnesium, but it's definitely much more commonly called a Grignard reagent. And the ether is there because you actually get something that looks like this, where you have your Grignard, and then you have the ether. Um, the lone pairs on the, on the oxygen of the ether are sort of donating electrons to the magnesium. Don't need to worry about this, but that's, this, is, this is why you need the ether solvent. All right, organocopper, uh, I have a completely different structure also. So let's go, uh, let's look at that on the next page. Organocopper reagents, uh, also known as cuprate or Gilman reagents. I will call them cuprates because that's how I learned it. But the, there's also these other names. They're pre, they are prepared from organolithium reagents by reaction with a copper salt, usually copper iodide. So here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. Rx plus 2Li gives you, there's your, there's your lithium reagent, right? So we do the same reaction we did on the previous page. And then um, you add copper iodide. Notice you have two R groups here, R2CULI. So the copper stays, the lithium stays, and that's a cuprate. So two steps. Number one, make organolithium. Number two, add a copper iodide. Okay, so that's how you make those. Let me give you an example. And you could use a vinyl chloride for this reaction. So this is what it would look like. You add the lithium, you don't need to put the two in front of the lithium. I'm not worried about that. Then you add copper iodide. And you get two R groups bonded to the copper and then you have C-U-L-I, just like that. All right, so those are the three reagents. Need to know how to make those, those three reagents. Um, Grignard reagents are the form RMGX, and you can have bromine, chlorine, or iodide. No, no, no fluorides here. Organolithium is R-L-I, and organocuprate is R2-C-U-L-I. Need to know that. Um, they react as if they were carbanions. They are not true carbanions because they have covalent carbon metal bonds. However, we can think about them conceptually as carbanions. So a carbanion would be an ionic compound, and these aren't because it's a covalent bond. 
um, but that's the way they react. Compare this with sodium acetylide, and we have here um, carbon 2.5 and sodium 0.9. And this, but this guy's actually ionic, so it's right on the borderline here. It's actually ionic. So conjugate base of um, a terminal alkyne, this is negatively charged, and then we have Na+. So they're going to behave in a lot of the same ways, but they're not exactly the same because this is an ionic compound. So here we have electronegativity difference is 1.6. So it's somewhere around 1.6, 1.7 is where you start getting into ionic compounds. Questions so far? Anybody? All right, let's talk about reactions of organometallic reagents. Here are some examples. They're, uh, organometallic reagents, powerful bases, extremely powerful bases. They react rapidly with protons in an acid-base reaction. So this is what it looks like here. This is an acid-base reaction, and we'll, we'll draw out the reaction, and then we'll, then we'll see which, which way the equilibrium is favored. So the arrow is going to come from the carbon-magnesium bond. We're going to grab a proton, and then we're going to break the hydrogen-oxygen bond. Very rapid reaction with water. So there's the hydrogen that we just added on. Let me mark that. That's the hydrogen right here. So you're going to get that plus H-O-M-G-B-R. You can write it like that, or you can write it like uh, you get a hydroxide, you get an Mg2+, plus, and you get a Br-. minus. Okay, so that's what happens when you hydrolyze a Grignard. Let's look at the direction of equilibrium. So we're going to look at for conjugate acid base pairs. And what do we have here? So we have water and we have hydroxide over here. Conjugate acid base pairs right here. Um, the one with the extra proton is the acid. So here's our acid on this side of the equation. And here's our another conjugate acid base pair. Here's our acid on this side of the equation. Um, this has a pKa of about 15. And this has a pKa of about um, 50. So as you can see, equilibrium very strongly favored to the right. So long arrow to the right, um, tiny, tiny, short arrow. It really, there is no reverse reaction for this, but we'll just write, draw it that, like write that anyway. All right, um, so same thing with um, organolithium reagents. And so you gotta be careful with these guys so that you don't have proton sources around. If you have proton sources around, then you will hydrolyze. So proton sources can be water, could be acids, any acidic protons. So there we just, we just put a hydrogen there. And then we get a carboxylate. All right, so it's easy to forget about that, but this, that's the fastest thing that's going to happen with these guys. If there's a proton source, they will react with it. And direction of equilibrium, let's do that again here. So here's our acid on this side of the equation. Here's our acid on this side of the equation. This is um, pKa about 5. This is pKa about 45. So once again, very, very strongly favored to the, le to the right. So try not to forget that. It's really easy to forget when you're doing synthesis. We get so caught up in the carbonyl that we forget about these acidic hydrogens that, that kind of interfere with what we're trying to do. All right, so this rapid reaction with water or any protic acid means that Grignard reagents or ganolithium cuprates cannot be prepared from compounds that contain acidic groups. If you want to make a Grignard and your compound has an acidic group, you can't make a Grignard from it. So here's the acidic groups that interfere. Anything uh, in here, uh, there's an acidic hydrogen right here, a hydrogen on a nitrogen. Here's another acidic hydrogen. Hydrogen attached to sulfur. 
carboxylic acid, acidic hydrogen, even a terminal alkyne, hydrogen on a terminal alkyne. You can't make grignards from these compounds. So don't make a grignard. A grignard um, or organolithium compound. from compounds that contain these groups. All right, so that's super important and very, very easy to forget. As I, can, as I will tell you when I grade exams, I will see a lot of people forgetting about that. <clears throat> All right, so here's an example of a failed synthesis. This person is trying to make a grignard from this compound here. So remember, when we make the Grignard, the magnesium goes in between the carbon and the bromine bond. So um, we have here Mg, ether. You actually will make a little bit of this. But as soon as you make it, it's going to be uh, protonated by any acidic hydrogens that are in the medium. So another molecule here, definitely. So you make that, and then any other proton sources, and there, there are any, any of, of these other compounds here. So air comes from the carbon-magnesium bond, grabs the hydrogen, and looks like that. And then, so what you end up getting is ethanol, not what you wanted. You wanted to make a Grignard out of this compound. So you're going to get that, and you're going to get um, deprotonated alcohol. So you can draw it like this, um, or you can draw this like this with BrCH2. CH2, O, M, G, B, R. Okay, you can write it either way, but that's what you're going to get. All right, so that's a big problem. That's not a Grignard reagent. So these guys are the actual products. So this rapid reaction with water and any protic acid can be used to synthetically turn an alkyl halide into a hydrocarbon. If you use um, a labeled uh, proton source like D2O, you can actually make deuter deuterated compounds. So here's an example right here. Uh, we're gonna make, we have no acidic hydrogens here, so we will be able to make this Grignard rather nicely here. So the magnesium ends up being going in between the carbon and the bromine. And then if you protonate this, if you, if you actually deliberately add water, you will protonate that. So, so that's a way to actually get rid of this bromine in our molecule. So that's what you would get. Um, if you use uh, D2O instead, or some sort of proton source that has deuterium, then you'll get CH2D. So there's the deuterium. Let's, let's circle that deuterium from one of these bonds here. And now you've made it a deuterated compound. And that's just by protonating the Grignard. Once you form it, you protonate it. Um, and uh, if you use a deuterated um, proton source, you'll get a deuterium incorporated. Questions so far? Anybody? All right, so organometallic reagents are powerful nucleophiles. Um, they're very important in organic chemistry. They can react with epoxides to form alcohols. The result is an extension of the carbon chain by two carbons. So what am I talking about? Um, let's, let's 
keep an eye on this number here. Okay, so that's going to keep an eye on that. We're going to come back and circle those when we come back. All right, so we're making, again, a lithium compound. So alkyl lithium. All right, and now we're going to open up an epoxide. So this is going to attack an epoxide. It's going to be very similar to lithium aluminum hydride attacking an epoxide. Arrow is going to come from the carbon lithium bond. If this was a substituted epoxide, it would attack on the least substituted side. Let's circle that original um, group that we started with. Here's our three carbons right here. Here's our three carbons right here. And you see how I've added on two carbons. I've added on a CH2, CH2, O minus. Once we protonate that, it will be a CH2, CH2, OH. And that is, that's something you might want to tuck away. You might, you might see that on a future exam where you have to add on a two-carbon piece that looks like that. We're going to talk about other ways to add on two-carbon pieces, but this will add on a CH2CH2OH. Two-carbon extension where the functional group is on the end. Okay, so we did it. We had another two carbon extension in chapter 11, right? Where we took acetylene, we deprotonated it, and we attacked an alkyl halide. That was also adding on a two carbon piece. Okay, just different functional groups. All right, so good thing to tuck away. We're, and so and what, what I think would be a good idea right now is if you have an index card or a, a larger index card or a sheet where you start to now write carbon carbon bond forming reactions. We have one from 51B, and we're going to now have a, we're going to have now, we, now we have Grignard's organolithiums and cuprates here um, for 51C. So those are great when you're trying to um, build up carbon skeletons. All right, longer extensions can be made by using substituted epoxides. So here's another example here. What side is this going to attack on, left or right? Powerful nucleophile attacks on the less, least substituted side, right? This goes back to chapter 9. All right, so that's what's going to happen here. It's going to come and attack on the least substituted side. We're going to kick electrons up onto oxygen. That's at the very ch end of chapter 9 if you want to take a look uh, at that. And after protonation, and there's our phenyl ring. So we've added on actually a four carbon piece. Uh, where the hydroxyl is in the two position. Okay, so that, that's just something to keep in mind here. We've added on a one, two, and then this is three and four if we drew out that ethyl. Added on a four carbon extension. And so just remember that this is, of course, a strong nucleophile. Attacks at the least substituted side of the epoxide. All right, so Grignards can, uh, can be protonated. They can attack epoxides, but the, the most important reactions that we see with Grignards are Grignards attacking carbonyls. Okay, so let's look at some examples of that. Let's look at some examples with type 1 and type 2 carbonyls. 
So here's a typical reaction with a type 1 carbonyl. So we have um, ethyl magnesium bromide or ethyl grignard. Arrow is going to come from the carbon magnesium bond. These are going to look just like lithium aluminum hydride. Okay, so we have we're going to do a very similar way. Arrow is going to come from the carbon magnesium covalent bond. We're going to attack the carbonyl carbon. We're going to kick electrons up onto oxygen. So this will look really familiar to you. It looks just like the mechanism for the lithium aluminum hydride with the type one carbonyl, except Rather than um, transferring a hydride, we're actually transferring an alkyl group. So we're building up carbon skeletons. Um, but still the same thought process in that we have um, tetrahedral intermediate with no leaving group. Therefore, it stops here until you add acid in a second step. So really key here is that we want to have the water in a second step. What happens if we mix the Grignard and the water? What's the, going to happen? We're going to, we're going to kill our Grignard reagent. A, a word that you'll hear used is we're going to quench it. It's going to, we're going to kill that because the acid-base reactions are going to be faster. And so then our Grignard will be gone and then we don't get anything that we want. So add water in a second step. Well, mechanistically, very similar to lithium aluminum hydride. All right, question about reactions with type 1 carbonyls. Anybody? All right, so we can agree organolithium, same. We're, we're, like I said, most of the time we're using organ Grignards and organolithium interchangeably, except for one reaction. So, same thing happens here with the organolithium. These guys are more powerful, but um, in this instant, it would, in instance, it would do the exact same thing. And then, of course, we're going to add water in a second step. And same thing as when you're using lithium aluminum hydride, you cooled the reaction vessel down in an ice bath, and then you cautiously add a drop of water, you wait for the exothermic reaction to go away, and then you add more. Okay, so it's really very, very extremely strong base here. All right, so that's type 1 carbonyls, um, organomagnesium, organolithium cuprates. We're going to talk about a little bit later because they do different chemistry. They're sort of their own category. Sodium acetylide, we've talked about sodium acetylide reagents. We know that they can open up epoxides. They can also attack carbonyls. So familiar reagent, unfamiliar reaction, but you probably um, predicted that this, something like this would happen. I'm not worrying about stereochemistry because we have achiral reagents reacting with achiral reagents. So it's going to look like that. Okay, and then um, we add water in a second step. And notice something also, when we use acetaldehyde, we're adding on a two-carbon piece. But it's different than the two-carbon piece we do with an epoxide. 
So we've also added on two carbons. So let me circle what we started with. So this is one, two. This is um, also adds on a two carbon piece. What's the difference between this two carbon piece and the one we did with an epoxide? They're not the same, right? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, no, we're at, well, we started with this. We're adding two carbons onto this. Depends on the perspective. If you're looking from the perspective of the acetaldehyde, yes, we're adding on three pieces. But if, if we're starting with this, and we're, at, we're adding on two pieces right here. So the only difference here between this is, remember, when we added on the two carbon piece with an epoxide, it was CH2, CH2, OH. The OH was on the end. Here the OH is right where we were, were, were bonded directly to the carbon um, of, our, of our nucleophile. So the only difference is the location of the OH. Sometimes you want to use an epoxide. It depends on what you're doing afterwards. It depends on what you're trying to synthesize. But this, I want you to point out that this, when you use acetaldehyde, you're also adding on a two carbon piece. Okay, it's just the only difference is where the hydroxyl is. So I'm just trying to point these things out to you because they're going to be relevant when you do start doing synthesis. All right, let's look at a typical reaction with a type 2 carbonyl. All right, and I'm not going to show you the product because we're going to work through what the product is. Another possible mechanism for uh, midterm one. Arrow's going to come from the methyl carbon magnesium bond. We attack the carbonyl carbon. We kick electrons up onto oxygen. So let's just kind of follow it along. We know leaving groups that we, we know things that can be leaving groups in this reaction. We know things that cannot be leaving groups in this reaction. So here's our tetrahedral intermediate. Does it have a leaving group? Yes, tetrahedral intermediate has leaving group. If it has a leaving group, it's going to leave. So electrons on oxygen are going to come down, and we're going to kick off our leaving group. And now we're going to look at the product that we get, and we're going to make a decision about if something more is going to happen or not. All right, so our product of that is acetone, so it's a ketone. Is a ketone more reactive or less reactive than an ester? It's more reactive than an ester. So that means the, the Grignard is going to add again. You can't stop here. Why can't you stop there? Uh, ketones are, are more reactive than esters. All right, so what that means is that the Grignard's going to add again. All right, arrow comes from the carbon-magnesium bond. Now we're attacking a type 1 carbonyl. We know what's going to happen next. We know that since it's a type 1, we are not going to have a leaving group. Absolutely no possible leaving groups here. All right, so our, our tetrahedral intermediate has no leaving group. Therefore, it's going to stop here. Until we add a proton source, and we're going to add water first. So 
so conceptually, the same thing is happening here as was happening with lithium aluminum hydride. We're doing the same thing. We're adding more than once here. And so we, uh, we have certainly have to add H2O in a second step. And then when we do that, we get our alcohol. So this is also a synthesis of alcohols. So there's our product. We figured it out ourselves here. And so um, the way that I want you to approach these problems is rather than just memorizing products, I want you to go through this thought process and figure out what the product is yourself. So um, it turns out that you uh, must use two equivalents of Grignard. If you think you can trick it and only use one equivalent and get that product cleanly, you're wrong. What you will get is that product and unreacted starting material. Okay, so if, if you only use one equivalent, if you only use one equivalent, you will get 50% conversion. All right, now um, I don't remember what, specifically what kind of sapling problem, but there was, there was a sapling problem with either this or um, uh, lithium aluminum hydride, and they asked for all the organic products. And so you just got to remember that right here, I just kicked off a methoxy group. So I'm also going to get methanol as a product, aren't I, when I start with an ester. So you want to keep that in mind. So you're going to get this, plus you're gonna, this, this methoxy group that you made is going to get protonated. Now, I don't normally worry about that side product, but it could be something that you would have to worry about if you were actually doing the reaction. So you're going to get that product and you're going to get methanol. So two products. Questions on um, inability to stop at the ketone. Anybody having trouble with that? I, I think one of the common misconceptions that I see in, in, in um, organic chemistry is people think, well, if I just use one equivalent and everything reacts simultaneously, then it should be able to stop at what I want. Okay? And it's not that way because these reactions are not happening simultaneously. So in other words, if, if I lined up all the esters in a row, and then I lined up all the Grignards right next to them, okay, in a long line. And I said, okay, on your market set, go. Then they all reacted simultaneously. Then I would be able to stop with the ketone. But you, you and I know that's impossible to do. They're reacting a little bit at a time. And as soon as you make a more reactive product, it's going to react faster with the Grignard that re hasn't reacted yet. Okay, so I know that's tricky, but that's just the way it, that's the way it works. All right, questions on that aspect, anybody? We like to think we're in charge of these molecules, but we're really not. They're going to do what they're going to do, as any grad student will tell you. All right. Okay, let's, try, let's do an example with an acid chloride and organolithium reagent. Same idea here. Let's go through the mechanism. So another possible mechanism for a midterm one. We've got a lot here. Do you remember to put lone pairs on all your reacting atoms when you're doing a mechanism? So let's see what we get here. So rather than just writing what the answer is, I'm going to, I, I like to go through it so we can, you can think your way through to the answer. All right, tetrahedral intermediate has leaving group.
So electrons on oxygen come down and kick off that fantastic leaving group. Chloride's a, a fantastic leaving group. All right, so then let's look at the product and let's make some decisions here. What's more reactive, an acid chloride or a ketone? Acid chloride. So theoretically, we should be able to stop here. Um, the problem is the same problem we had with lithium aluminum hydride. They're just, too, it's too reactive to stop there. Okay, it's just way too reactive. So um, it's going to add again, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, if you want that product. Okay, so it's going to add again. So, and we'll label that very clearly. Should be able to stop here. Because an acid chloride is more electrophilic than a ketone by far. The problem is, is that Grignards are too reactive. All right, so you can't stop here. So these powerful reagents are just too powerful to stop. And so it's going to add again, and so what do we get from that step when it adds again? We get, gosh, we get the same thing that, that we get with a, an ester. We get the same exact thing. Whoops, I skipped a step, didn't I? Let's fix that. So you get an alkoxide. Same alcohol you get with an ester. Tetrahedral intermediate has no leaving group. Therefore, it stops here. And then when you add water, we protonate and we get the same exact product. So there's two examples of a reaction with type 2 carbonyls. Yes? Um, should that say a different problem? Should that say a gadolithium to the reaction? Eh, yeah, right. How about that? Organolithium. Thank you for catching that. They're so interchangeable, I'm interchanging the names, and I shouldn't do that. Okay. More questions? Anybody? All right, so Grignards will also add twice to acid chlorides because they're too reactive. Cuprates, which are the least reactive organometallic reagents, will add only once. So cuprates do their own chemistry. Think of them in their own special category. Okay, this reaction only works with acid chlorides. Only works with acid chlorides. No other carbonyls. Okay, so, so cuprates having copper, now copper is a transition metal, and so they do have their own different chemistry that's completely different than um, Grignard's and organolithium compounds. Um, but they do, um, they will react with acid chlorides to make ketones. Now, I'm going to draw arrows for this. This isn't really how this reaction takes place. But this is a way you, you can think about it. Um, cuprates, again, they do their own chemistry and it involves radical reactions. But I'm not going to show you that. I'm just trying to give you a conceptual basis here. Um, but the idea here is that these are going to attack the carbonyl carbon and they, um, they, remember, these were the least reactive of the three, so they will only react with acid chlorides.
And um, since they only react with acid chlorides, when we form the ketone here, it's not going to react again. So we have the tetrahedral intermediate has leaving group. So leaving group's going to leave. Electrons come down, kick off the leaving group. And since cuprates don't attack any other carbonyls but acid chlorides, um, we, it stops here. So if we want to stop at the ketone, we have to use an acid chloride with a cuprate. If we use an acid chloride with a granite or organolithium, it will add twice and give you the alcohol. So that's the, that's the way to do this. All right, and let's just label this when you go back. I, I won't ask for cuprate mechanisms. This is not the true mechanism. Way too complicated, uh, the true mechanisms are not completely 100% understood and um, way too complicated for this class. Okay, yes? That, that compound there with an aldehyde on one side and an acid chloride, those are very unstable, so I don't know if you can actually do the cuprate reaction. Do you know? They're, they're, they're very unstable. They decompose into carbon monoxide and hydrochloric acid, so I don't know whether, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. What about carboxylic acids? Will they work in this reaction? Well, Remember, we, we, remember what we don't want to forget. We're so tapped into the carbonyl, we don't want to forget about the acidic hydrogen. Don't forget acidic hydrogen. All right, so the first thing that's going to happen, these guys are extremely powerful bases. We're going to deprotonate that acidic hydrogen. All right, and we know something about um, carboxylates. We know that they're the least reactive of all the carbonyls. So the question is, are, are carboxylate, and you look at a carboxylate, you normally think of an electrophile as having a, a partial positive charge or a full positive charge, right? This has a negative charge, so we would, it's, it's kind of strange to think of it as an electrophile anyway. Uh, but the question is, um, is a Grignard, our side product is methane, by the way, that's our side product, that's methane gas, which is going to bubble off the reaction mixture. And um, the question is, is if, we, if, we, if we have an additional equivalent agreement, Grignard, is it strong enough to attack a carboxylate? And the answer is no. So uh, methyl magnesium bromide. is not powerful enough. So it's powerful, but we've, we've come to the limit of its, of its strength. Not powerful enough to attack a carboxylate. Okay, so if it's not powerful enough to attack a carboxylate, which is what is powerful enough to attack a carboxylate? Organolithium. Okay, so this is the one reaction where they do have a different something happening. Organolithium is more powerful. So if we want to have that happen again, we'll talk about what happens next time. See if you could try to figure it out on your own.